Hello everyone, I'm Stephanie Beckler from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with the United Nations Foundation Energy Access Practitioner Network. Today's webinar is focused on towards, energy, towards universal energy access in West Africa, the role of distributed energy solutions for the post-Ebola recovery in Sierra Leone. Before we begin, I'll go over some of the webinar's features. Uh, for audio, there are two options. You can either listen through your computer or over the phone. If you listen through the computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. And if you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option, and a box on the right-hand side will display the phone number. If anyone's having technical difficulties with the webinar, you can connect to the GoToWebinar help desk at 888-259-3826 for assistance. If you would like to ask a question during the webinar, and we encourage that you do, please use the question pane provided in the toolbar. If you're having any difficulty viewing the materials through the portal, you'll find PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training. Also, an audio recording and will be posted to the Solution Center training page within a few days of the broadcast. And it will also be added to the Solution Center YouTube channel, where you can find other informative webinars, as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. One important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solution Center's resource library as one of many best practices, resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. <clears throat> Today's webinar agenda uh, is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, uh, Yasmin Irboy Ruff, Aminata Dumbuya, and Alexander Tour, uh, who have joined us to discuss the impacts to date, current opportunities, and remaining challenges in scaling distributed energy solutions in West Africa, focusing on Sierra Leone. Before we jump into the presentations, I'll provide a quick overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. And following the presentations, we will have a question and answer session moderated by Yasmin. And then we will open it up to the audience for questions that are submitted through the question pane. At the end of the webinar, you'll be automatically prompted to fill out a brief survey. So we thank you in advance for taking a moment to respond. The Solution Center was launched in 2011 under the Clean Energy Ministerial. Uh, the Clean Energy Ministerial is a high-level global forum to promote policies and programs that advance clean energy technology share lessons learned and best practices, and to encourage the transition to a global clean energy economy. 24 countries in the European Commission are members, covering 90% of the clean energy investment and 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The webinar is provided by the Clean Energy Solutions Center, which focuses on helping government policymakers design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technologies. This is accomplished through support in crafting and implementing policies related to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools, such as the webinar you are attending today. The Clean Energy Solutions Center is co-sponsored by the governments of Australia, Sweden, and the United States with in-kind support from the government of Mexico. The Solutions Center provides several clean energy policy programs and services, including a team of over 60 global experts that can provide remote and in-person technical assistance to governments and government-supported institutions, no-cost virtual webinar trainings on a variety of clean energy policy topics, partnership building with development agencies and regional and global organizations to deliver support, and an online library containing over 5,500 clean energy policy-related publications, tools, videos, and other resources. Our primary audience is made up of energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries, but we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. The Solution Center is an international initiative that works with more than 35 international partners in, across a suite of different programs. Several of the partners are listed above, including research organizations like IRENA and the IEA, programs like se for all and regionally focused entities such as the ECOWAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. A marquee feature of the Solutions Center is the no-cost expert policy assistance known as Ask an Expert. Ask an Expert service 
the Afghan Expert Service matches policymakers with one of more than 50 global experts selected as authoritative leaders on specific clean energy finance and policy topics. For example, in the area of grid integration, energy management, and resource assessments, we are pleased to have Kuda Nalukula, consultant and energy infrastructure expert, serving as one of our experts. If you need, have a need for policy assistance in grid integration, energy management, resource assessments, or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. Again, it's provided free of charge, and if you have any questions for our experts, please submit it through our simple online form at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. I'd now like to provide brief introductions for today's panelists. Uh, first up is Yasmin Erboy Ruff. She is a senior officer with the UN Foundation's Energy and Climate Team, primarily assisting in coordinating efforts to scale up energy access in developing countries. Following Yasmin, we'll hear from Aminata Dumbuya. She leads the Power for All campaign in Sierra Leone and secured the campaign as a sector leader and the go and the go-to on energy access and specifically decentralized renewable energy issues in the country. Our final speaker today is Alexander Tor. He is the CEO and co-founder of Azimuth in West Africa, a West African country distributing Pico solar products on a rent-to-own basis and operating in Sierra Leone under the name Easy Solar. With those introductions, I'd like to welcome Yasmin Irboy Ruff to the webinar. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, give me a second to set this up. Can you see my screen okay? That looks perfect. Okay, great. Um, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon if you're joining us from Sierra Leone or um, around the world. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today, where we'll be looking at universal energy access in Sierra Leone, sort of as a representative more broadly of um, West Africa. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of our work at the UN Foundation, and particularly the Energy Access Practitioner Network, for those of you who might be joining us uh, for the first time. Um, many of you, I'm sure, have heard this before, so I'm going to try to keep it short and sweet. Um, give you a little primer on Sierra Leone, and then I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. As many of you know, um, we continue to have over 1.1 billion people around the world with no access to electricity, and many um, who have limited access. So the Energy Access Practitioner Network was established in 2011 by the United Nations Foundation as a contribution to the Sustainable Energy Pro Initiative um, to serve as the now currently the largest global network of um, a very mixed bag of stakeholders. Uh, we have primarily small and medium enterprises, um, practitioners, energy service providers in our uh, network, but we also have many social enterprises, civil society, academia, government agencies, individuals, anybody who is looking at scaling energy access, particularly in developing countries, primarily for um, rural electrification, last mile distribution, market-led solutions, all are welcome to join. There is no fee to join, um, and it is as much, um, as much as every member makes of it. So the main goals of the practitioner network is to contribute to the sustainable development goal of universal energy access um, by sharing knowledge. So um, we, we have a number of uh, what we call doorstep services, including our monthly webinars, which, one, which is uh, one of which is happening today, uh, our monthly newsletters, uh, direct emails, um, our website resources, different ways to, through which we virtually try to share um, as many uh, news and opportunities that are happening in this very fast-moving space with all of our members. We now um, have over 2,500 members from 170 countries. So that is a very large network of people that we can leverage for different purposes around scaling energy access um, and catalyzing action, and one of which is also building partnerships. So we try to build partnerships between practitioners, but also between practitioners and investors facilitating increased funding and financing of decentralized energy solutions to the space. Now coming to this particular webinar, uh, we are hoping to highlight the, um, the challenges and also the impact to date of scaling distributed energy solutions in West Africa, again, as I mentioned, focusing on Sierra Leone. 
Um, this webinar is the third in a series of country-focused webinars that we have established this year to delve into the state of energy access across the globe, country by country. This was a request directly from our members and uh, partners of the Practitioner Network to look at country-level engagement and also hear from in-country um, organizations. So we're very happy to have both Amy and um, Alex with us today, and it is a pleasure also to be collaborating with Power for All on this particular webinar. Um, looking at our membership, we have over 50 practitioner network members, um, organizations uh, currently operating in Sierra Leone, um, and we're also going to be live tweeting this webinar for those of our members who are not going to be able to join us um, on time. So you can follow at Energy Access PN using hashtag PNWebinar for uh, content related to this webinar. Um, quickly looking at uh, sort of setting the scene up for energy access in Sierra Leone. Um, this is a quick heat map um, courtesy of Sustainable Energy for All that shows the large gap countries. So Sustainable Energy for All has um, uh, established a number of priority countries under three different uh, sort of headers, uh, large gap countries, which is pretty self-explanatory. These are the countries where there is still a very significant gap on um, energy access. High impact countries where um, scaling energy access would make the most impact, so the, the largest number of people, um, and fast moving countries where policy and uh, in-country actions already moving very well, um, and these are sort of the countries we're looking to as great examples for others to follow up on. As we can all guess, Sierra Leone falls under the 20 countries with the lowest electrification rates. And here we can see these large gap countries sort of laid out by uh, total rural and urban population and the um, energy access rates both for urban and rural. And we can see that the rural population has a dismal 1%. Um, energy access, so it is definitely a very challenging country. And here is um, some new, some uh, very recent information from the Regulatory Indicators for Sustainable Energy, or RISE, um, which was just launched, I believe, about a month or so ago. So this kind of, again, shows the uh, the lack of energy access in Sierra Leone, the overall score um, from 1 to 100, 100 being great. Um, obviously, Sierra Leone with a score of 14 um, definitely has a long way to go. But what was interesting to me when looking at the RISE data was that, um, sort of, I've highlighted it for you here, um, the framework for grid electrification received a score of zero, which is obviously not good, but the framework for mini grids, standalone systems, and the consumer affordability of electricity all seem to have much higher scores. Again, still not probably as high as it should be, but this to me is very encouraging for um, the role of decentralized energy solutions in Sierra Leone. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amy and Alex uh, to hear from them directly how this might be the case. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yasmin. And next we will go to Aminato Dumbuya. Hi, thank you very much, Yasmin. Thank you, Stephanie. This is a great opportunity to be a part of this um, session. And I just want to echo from the last slide um, that, yes, as much as it's, uh, you know, Sierra Leone is scoring um, 14, and just like Yasmin said, the opportunities uh, for mini-grid and standalone systems, as well as affordability, are quite promising. Um, um, with that said, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the campaign, the Power for All campaign, um, and as well as talk about the Sierra Leone environment in terms of what the Ministry of Energy is doing and, and what's Power for, what Power for All is doing locally to support the campaign. Um, <clears throat> so, to start off, uh, Power for All is a global campaign that uh, works to accelerate decentralized renewable, that advocates decentralized renewable energy in the country, it, it, well globally, sorry I just got an interruption. <laughs> yeah, so we're a global campaign that, that focuses on, on advocating for decentralized renewable energy and we're activated in three markets, Sierra Leone, um, Nigeria, and Zimbabwe. And our work here in Sierra Leone um, uh, 
um, is as a result of the Sierra Leone Energy Revolution and the Energy Africa Compact that, that um, the Ministry of Energy of Sierra Leone and the UK government entered into about a year ago. And what the campaign has been doing is to support um, the government in terms of implementing on its commitments. Um, so what we see here um, in Sierra Leone is that the Ministry is taking an integrated approach to energy access. Um, so in addition, um, the central in addition to the central um, it sounds like we're losing a little bit of um, Aminata's audio right now, so I'm going to try to connect with her and see if we can strengthen um, the audio. In the meantime, um, Alex, if you wouldn't mind, I think we're going to skip to your presentation right now and see if we can work with uh, Ami on reestablishing re her connection. Sure. Um, yeah, that's fine. I hope my internet connection will, will work um, as well. I'm sure we're not very far without me, so. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, that's fine. Um, can you can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can now. That looks great. Okay, fantastic. Um, thanks a lot um, for the introduction. I'm very happy to take part in, in this um, in this webinar. Um, thousand homes. And, oh, um, Emmy's back. Okay, um, I just want to start very quickly um, by providing you with you know a little bit of background on on what we do as at Easy Solar um, to hopefully give you some perspective on where uh, the comments I'll be making on on the Sierra Leone uh, and West African market um, are coming from. Um, we're basically a eco solar uh, eco company, um, and if I should give one sort of specificity um, of our company is that we're distributing a very a fairly large range of products. Um, from very small lanterns um, all the way to fairly large um, systems, roughly 70 watts. Um, and each and every of our products, um, including the half a watt lantern, um, is available on a pay-go uh, payment plan. And I'll try to you know, get into why we believe it's important um, and relevant in the Sierra Leone market later in the, in the presentation. Um, we've been operating full-time in Sierra Leone for almost seven months now. Um, and we're happy to have a few uh, thousand uh, of customers um, with us. Um, and when we created the company, we really looked, uh, it was in 2015 that we were defining the business model. Uh, we really looked a lot at the East African uh, companies, trying to understand what was working, what was not working, um, and most importantly, trying to see how we could port this um, into the context and the specific challenges of West Africa. Um, and I think that's what I'd like to focus on in this presentation, um, is you know, taking you through um, uh, two of those uh, specific challenges um, and talking about how we are trying to uh, um, address them. Um, I think the first one, um, which is probably not a surprise to a lot of people um, listening today, um, is the lack of uh, mobile money. Um, in Sierra Leone specifically, uh, there are only three um, MNOs, um, and actually the third one, Smart, um, is sort of dying, I think, at the moment. So we actually only have two MNOs, um, Airtel and Africell. Um, Airtel has sort of been leading with their Airtel money um, service, um, but they really have focused on the more urban centers and haven't reached at all um, the rural areas of the country. Um, AfriCell, on the other hand, has only recently, and when I say recently, it's like a couple of weeks ago, uh, launched their mobile money service um, in Sierra Leone, um, and they're still sort of finalizing uh, more of the technical aspects of it, um, and haven't really moved um, yet into an environment where um, they're doing more, you know, focusing on marketing and, and expanding their um, distribution network. So overall, um, a market where we have very little uh, mobile money. Um, this has had like sort of two consequences, um, I guess, on our, our uh, model. Uh, the first one is we've had to learn um, how to scale a distribution uh, network uh, that's based on, on cash management. Um, I mean, it was just like, like, you know, given the reality, when we started selling products, 
uh, amongst our existing customers, um, and less than three percent of them um, had ever used uh, mobile money. So we quickly realized that you know we had we, we were going to have to learn how to work with cash. Um, and I won't go into too many details, but there's basically like sort of three um, areas. I think I think three key aspects that are starting to work and are starting to allow us to uh, manage a, a distribution network that's based on cash management. Uh, the first one is really try to identify um, any existing uh, distribution network that can allow you to collect cash. So whether it is, you know, microfinance institutions, local banks, um, even, you know, we're looking into some agricultural co cooperatives for, um, you know, helping us uh, collect cash in, in rural areas. Um, the second aspect of it um, is technology. Uh, there's usually some sort of a belief that um, Airtel, um, mobile money um, is very sort of, you know, operation, mobile money operations is very technology um, oriented and cash is going to be very pen and paper. This doesn't have to be the case. And for us, investing in the technology um, that allows us to manage uh, very closely our cash collection process has been uh, very important. Um, and the third and probably most interesting aspect um, has been really optimizing our distribution network um, around the, the reality um, of the fact that we we're going to have to visit our agents uh, extremely frequently um, to make sure that you know, cash collection didn't um, go out of hands. Um, so that being said, we obviously didn't give up on mobile money, uh, and we're, we're working very closely with Airtel um, and AfriCell, uh, um, you know, integrating their mobile money service into our operations. That being said, I think what's happening and is interesting is that, in, you know, unlike in, in East Africa where a lot of Pago solo companies have piggybacked on existing distribution networks from mobile money companies, what we're seeing currently in Sierra Leone, um, and this is also the case in a number of other West African countries, I believe, um, is that we, as a Pago solo company, are at the forefront of the expansion of the mobile money distribution um, network. Um, and the way this happens is actually that a number of our agents actually are um, also mobile money agents, um, or trained to be mobile money agents, and they are the ones who are introducing mobile money um, in their communities. Um, so that was it for um, mobile money. I guess the, the second aspect is if you look at awareness around solar in East Africa in let's say you know 2016 or 2017, it's it's pretty high. Um, there's some sort of a you know market um, awareness around solar. People start to know different brands. They can compare different products. Um, in West Africa and most specifically in Sierra Leone, uh, that's absolutely not the case. Um, there's very little awareness around solar. Uh, um, and when there is, it's um, around bad quality, uh, poor, poor quality soul, a, neg a negative um, image. Um, and I think there's been a lot of sort of research um, and discussions around how to do last mile uh, marketing um, and ensuring that you can actually increase the awareness and, and the trust um, around uh, uh, Pico Solar uh, and distributed energy products in, in general. Um, I just want to focus on, on one of them, uh, which I believe is interesting and, and kind of unique. Um, I think our best sort of um, marketing initiative has been our product mix. Um, so I was mentioning initially the fact that we're selling um, very small lanterns, actually the one you can see on, on this slide, um, half of what lanterns on a pay-go uh, basis, meaning that they're virtually affordable for anyone. Um, we're talking about a lantern that's less than $20 um, that people can pay um, over three or four months. Um, so it's literally affordable from every um, in almost any given Sierra Leone, um, and this has been our best way um, to market solar, to market our brand, to market pay-as-you-go, and to basically put high-quality solar and pay-as-you-go into every house, and then work our way up the energy ladder by selecting successful customers and upselling them to um, large products. Um, so that's it about the challenges. I think that I could cover um, many more, but in the interest of time, I, I think it's interesting if we can leave um, as much time as we can for the, the Q&A and address uh, questions that are of interest to the audience. Um, I quickly wanted to mention one very positive thing about Sierra Leone that's um, happened over the past uh, few months, almost a year now, um, which is the creation of the Renewable Energy Association um, of Sierra Leone. Um, it was created um, actually a little over a year ago, uh, and its vision is to accelerate the adoption of renewable energy for achieving the universal energy access and economic empowerment um, in Sierra Leone. Um, and I would really highly encourage anyone um, on this webinar who shares this vision um, 
to get in touch with us um, and, and help us in our um, in our efforts to promote renewable energy in, in Sierra Leone. Um, some of our key achievements, um, I guess, and, and objectives as well, um, have been overall uh, really coordinating the efforts of the private sector. Um, so bringing them together uh, to create the markets um, uh, for renewable energy products in, in Sierra Leone. We've been working a lot with the Ministry of Energy um, as well as with Powerful and EMI uh, to implement a duty waiver on high quality solar um, and energy efficiency products. Uh, we're working with the Central Bank of Sierra Leone for foreign currency issues. Um, there's global events that are organized to raise awareness uh, around uh, renewable energy. Uh, we've worked with the microfinance institutions as an association um, to promote and encourage them to distribute high quality solar products. Um, and we have a more sort of outward um, oriented aspect um, where we're trying to attract also um, um, investors and industrial partners to um, Sierra Leone. So again, I would highly encourage you to get in touch with the Renewable Energy Association of Sierra Leone um, if you're either interested in learning more uh, about the space in, in Sierra Leone um, or even you know, joining us in this, in this market. Um, and I'm also um, happy to answer um, any question you may have. Thank you. Alex, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, we are now going to uh, try and go back to Aminata and see if she's um, reestablished the connection. All right, it looks... All right, it looks like she's um, dropped off the webinar, so we'll try to uh, get, oh, it looks like she's reestablishing her connection right now. Um, so we will just give one minute to see if we can get her back online. I'm, hello, hello? Hello, can you hear us all right? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. I'm so sorry about this. For some reason, I'm in, right in the center of town. I wish I found out where Alex was so I can sit down with him and we can do this <laughs> together. Um, um, let's try it again. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, I was just giving an overview on what the um, Ministry of Energy is doing in terms of having an integrated outlook um, um, of um, energy access. It's not just they're shifting their focus from just grid and looking at um, the sector. And as a result, they've done a lot of different things um, policy-wise to build a uh, um, enabling environment. Um, like Alex mentioned, I did hear Alex's presentation, and good job, by the way, um, that they made sure that they included in the um, Finance Act of 2017 a VAT tariff waiver as well as an import, um, import duty waiver. That act is yet to be, um, to be ratified, but we're hoping that um, in April would be ratified. And this will basically enable companies to have a green lane access to be able to get goods out, um, out of the port. And, you know, um, also worth to note that the, uh, this green lane channel is linked to um, quality products, right? So it has to be IEC certified for companies to be able to take advantage of that. Um, um, also, there's an energy revolution task force that was set up as a result of the, the compact, and that task force basically is a um, is a combination of all major stakeholders. So members of the renewable energy associations have a at the table. Ourselves, um, powerful all, we're the conveners. Um, we have. Um, the main difference is that um, we've been able to look at a market-based program design that looks at um, policy, um, uh, creating and building demand, um, strengthening the supply, which is the sector companies, as well as um, um, as well as looking at access to finance for both consumer and um, capital finance for companies. Um, so that, that, that's that been going very well for the past year and um, an energy revolution program design will be launched for the ministry to be able to use to get more donor support um, um, for the compact. Um, as well as um, very recently the ministry has worked with one of the companies, um, I think it's Ignite Power, where they've mobilized about close to 700,000 um, um, youths that are in the Ataya base. Ataya base is a local um, tea shops that they have across the country that they're trying to indoctrinate into the solar home solar sector. Um, um, also, 
um, on the mini grids update, the government um, is working on the large, the large mini, uh, PV mini grid installations in, in West Africa, and this is in partnership between UNOPS and D and DFID. Um, the mini grids will be installed in 50 villages by the end of 20, 2017. And um, it's a four-year program with, which will ultimately benefit about 500,000 people. Um, also, WHH, which is Wealth Hunger Health, um, has a project where they're building solar mini grids in six districts. And there is a River Number no. Two project, which has it's a three one, three by one by five kilowatts of Pico Hydro. Um, and a total of six, six kilowatts of solar thermal plants um, in um, Number Two River. Um, some of the challenges that, that, that the sector is facing here um, mainly is unlocking finance. Um, I like that Alex talked about some of the innovative ways that they're looking to work with mobile companies. Um, unlocking because of the market in Sierra Leone, there are high interest rates um, from commercial banks that go up anywhere from 18 to 20. Percent and it's um, and these are limiting um, growth of the sector. The forex currency uh, risk hedging is high, um, and that's holding back the sector because obviously companies are having to purchase goods with forex, but the, the lending is in is in local local currency. Um, another challenge that's been faced that we're working as a campaign to support is lack of awareness. Um, just like Alex stated, the awareness level in West Africa is not the same as in East Africa. However, with that said, um, as a campaign, we've embarked on several roadshows. In fact, that's why I asked that we, um, we have this um, um, webinar at this time, because we had um, a roadshow that happened in the eastern part of Sierra Leone um, in Rutal. Rutal is one of the largest mining, mining towns, and that whole town is not connected to the grid. So we went there as a campaign with the Renewable Energy Association. Some member companies accompanied us and did a roadshow and sensitized people on, on, on the benefits of the products and the cost savings that they will ultimately have compared to replace with their with their gensets. Um, uh, as well as access to affordable uh, products for customers is, is, is another challenge, lack of consumer financing. What the campaign did was we convened um, um, uh, for the Sierra Leone Association of Microfinance Institutions to get into an MOU with the Renewable Energy Associations because as we know the microfinances have a wider geographic reach. They've been able to, they've been able to um, get into an MOU and they have over 100,000 um, uh, clients in their system, which is much larger than what the commercial banks offer. So the hope of the pilot is that the Renewable Energy Association companies can then, can, can then tap, sorry, can then tap into that resource and um, market directly to that market segment and get them to, to um, take the products and I believe um, Alex please correct me if I'm wrong that some that the, the project is already being implemented because they've been so great focused they've not really had like a, a strong person that's driving um, the renewable energy um, aspect of the ministry so um, there there is a, a need for technical assistance for the ministry to build up on that so that the renewable energy association companies can have, you know, point person in the ministry that they can effectively deal with that can also in turn can interface with um, other um, government um, MDAs. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of um, technical training for women to work with the Renewable Energy Association companies to be last mile distributors. Um, they have access to, and, to, to all the 149 chiefs and they've been working in the chiefdoms. And one of the key things that the, that the ministry also has been able to champion here is to make sure that they have a bottoms up approach alongside with them working with all the youths um, and linking youths up 
with companies to distribute solar. They've also engaged the local Paramount chiefs in all 149 chiefdoms. In fact, when we went um, just this couple, last couple of days to Rutile, um, we engaged the chief and the chief make sure that key stakeholders within that community are brought on board to see the benefits of the sector. Um, <clears throat> Moving on to the campaign, um, Power for All has been able to support government, like I said, with the Energy Revolution Task Force and implementing on policies. We've also been able to support the Renewable Energy Association through several several workshops that we convened with. Um, we convened an access to finance workshop where we brought together all the financial institutions in one room to see how we can um, unlock access um, for companies for the sector. Uh, we've also done uh, journalist um, training workshops to get journalists to know how to report better on the sector and get information out to people on, on the benefits of the um, home solar systems and decentralized renewable energy in general, um, as well as We've um, worked with Riazul on making, you know, getting them to do up um, various recommendations that they can put in front of key stakeholders, specifically the Ministry of Energy, which those recommendations will ultimately go into an MOU between themselves and the ministry to make sure that as an association they are the go-to entity that bets on behalf of government on all companies coming into the sector so that um, you know, the, and the uh, import duty that government is foregoing um, is being used in a in a responsible manner. Um, um, we've like we've also, like I said, we've also done uh, mass communications um, around with roadshows and different um, other um, above the line marketing tools. Um, just very recently, as recent as last week, um, the campaign wrapped up the first, its first phase and we ended it with a call to action event and that call to action um, was where all sector stakeholders from the Renewable Energy Association, from the government, from civil society organizations, um, from donor organizations as well as ourselves made bold commitments to taking um, steps and actions to accelerating access. I will share um, those commitments um, with you so that you can put them on the link, but um, that it was a, it was a well-attended event and um, moving forward as a campaign, we will be working with um, all stakeholders that have made those bold commitments to implement on those commitments. And um, that ends my presentation on what's happening with the campaign in Sierra Leone. Thank you so much, um, and thank you uh, for sticking with us and getting back on the connection. We really appreciate having um, both presentations. Um, I will now turn things over to uh, Yasmin to uh, mo begin moderating the first portion of the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Stephanie, and thank you again, Ami and um, Alex, for joining us. Um, this this is the the one uh, you know um, hard part of doing country specific webinars is that we understand obviously that the countries that we are interested in usually have um, energy access and internet access issues. So we really appreciate you sticking with us as well as all our audience uh, bearing with us to get all of this great information out. It was very very. Um, informative, I thought, and very interesting. You actually answered a lot of the questions that I was going to ask in between the two of you, so that's great. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to maybe ask a couple of follow-up questions just to dig a little deeper into some of the things that were already mentioned. Um, and this will be pretty quick, and then we can uh, open it up to our audience, who I'm sure have uh, great questions for you as well, to ensure that we have enough time for that as well. Um, but I just wanted to start with um, a quick question on the role of um, all the work that you are both doing, both on the coordination and policy side, as well as um, Alex, obviously, as a practitioner, sort of working on the delivery side um, of uh, distributed energy solutions for the Ebola recovery of Sierra Leone. Since we did mention that in the, <laughs> in the title of the webinar, um, I didn't want us to uh, not touch on that. So um, I guess here the, the interest that we have is, you know, obviously, as the Ebola outbreak happened, um, we kept a close eye on it through our membership, sort of trying to figure out what was going on on the ground, who was doing what. It was quite unfortunate, obviously, with some work that had already been done um, that had to be halted. We had many members um, who reported to us that they were right about to start operations in Sierra Leone, but had to hold off. We had one uh, of our own implementation efforts 
halt, um, you know, because of the same reason. So I was just interested to hear from you, since uh, you were in the thick of it, how it might have impacted progress, and on the flip side, and more positively, whether it might be an opportunity to move faster um, on scaling energy access with distributed energy solutions, as well as sort of, I guess, the uh, tension or difference between market-led and humanitarian um, efforts that might have had uh, to be taken either by yourselves or, you know, other colleagues that you have, other organizations working in Sierra Leone to sort of be able to um, respond to to this uh, humanitarian issue. Um, Hi, sorry, yes. If I mean, was I that a question for me or was that for Alex? It, it's for both of you, <laughs> either one. <laughs> okay, so you were asking if as a result of Ebola, um, mm -hmm. Did the market stop or did the market, I, I didn't quite understand the question. So I guess the question is, yes, exactly. One part is, it, it was the market impacted and how um, were, you, were your work specifically as well as, you know, others that you know in the sector affected how? And could it be an opportunity to move faster? Has there been more movement now that the outbreak has been contained? Absolutely. Um, I know for a fact, I think Azuri was one of the early um, players in the market and I think when they came in they distributed over 4,000 units and then right in the middle of their distribution Ebola struck so that immediately halted um, all of their work so that was that's one of the um, vivid examples that I can recall but in, as a result though um, I think the sector has moved a whole lot faster I can actually um, um, confidently say, especially for the home solar systems, um, mm -hmm. before the Sierra Leone energy revolution last year, where um, I think it was only 2,000 units that were, that, that had been, you know, shipped in. Now I can safely say we're 10 times that number. We're at about 20,000. So um, maybe it's because of Ebola that we're moving faster now to try to catch up with what's happening in East Africa. But there's a lot of um, activity going on on ground and it, it cuts across all sectors because we did lose um, mm -hmm. a substantial amount of work time um, as a country. So yes and no. <laughs> Alex, did you want to pitch in? Sure. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll provide a more, um, yeah, market. Um, so yeah, I mean, my, my answer to this might be a little disappointing. Um, we, we, we were not in, in country where Ebola hits. Um, I completely agree with, with Amy and I've heard, you know, stories of people who were in the field at the time trying to do some solar that it completely uh, destroyed their, their efforts, um, you know, to, to implement and, and develop a, a distribution network. Um, for us, like as a private sector company that started operations um, in you know 2016, um, Ebola has absolutely nothing to do with whatever we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, we're not doing things because of Ebola. Um, we're not getting funding because of Ebola. Um, if anything, um, the fact that Sierra Leone is still um, you know in the mind of a lot of people really like one of the Ebola tree is more a negative aspect for us from a funding perspective because when you go to like you know private um, funding um, venture capital uh, funds you know they always are afraid there some people are not completely aware that you know Ebola is done um, some people are not completely aware that malaria is killing more people every year than Ebola killed and you know those sort of things and so Ebola is kind of like the big um, thing that is scaring away um, some at least you know private capital um, I think you would definitely have a very different uh, perspective from a more humanitarian perspective. There's a lot of initiatives, um, you know, for donating solar home systems to Ebola survivors uh, and those programs that are being carried out by UN agencies and a number of other organizations. Um, but I would say from a private sector perspective, um, our message is more that, you know, uh, Sierra Leone has much, much, much more to offer, um, I guess, to the you know, development of, of um, um, you know, solar energy and distributed energy than being a Ebola recovering um, country. Uh, and I think Amy mentioned, you know, a lot of those aspects from the willingness of the government to move forward, um, willingness of the financial, some of the financial institution, um, a lot of activity in the, in the uh, private sector. Uh, we see a lot of things moving forward that I do not think are necessarily related to, to Ebola. Thank you both. Uh, can I just jump in? I just wanted to, Alex touched on something that I forgot in my presentation, was the civil society bit. Um, um, 
we work closely with the likes of um, IBIS and Oxfam. They've, um, they've been running school campaigns across six districts where um, um, they're using schools to get to get you know to the the teachers and the students to get to their parents. And what we've been trying to do, to, what we've been trying to do is to make sure that they don't distort the market by giving out free products. Um, we're trying to see how they link better with the private companies so that when they go and, and, and give out free products, at least they can say it's, it's a promotion or it's a limited time promotion and the private companies can then now come in and, and, you know, and follow suit. Exactly. That's that's sort of what I wanted to get out to make sure that um, you know, obviously in in a humanitarian crisis, uh, market-led solutions don't always work, or the market breaks down for a short time or for a long time. But we also want to ensure that um, any humanitarian efforts are not infringing on uh, you know the market that already exists. So I'm, I'm, it's encouraging to hear from both of you that that's not the case, and hopefully there is. Um, non-Ebola focused work going on as well as of course uh, continuing to rebuild after after the outbreak. And um, since you both mentioned financing and uh, both in your presentations and just now um, in answer to my question I wanted to maybe give you an opportunity to talk a bit more about um, the, the type I guess or the amount or the uh, the the nature of the financing that's missing. You both mentioned uh, lack of local currency, um, as well as, uh, I guess, from Alex, we've heard that investors are still scared, I guess, to, to look at Sierra Leone. Um, can you elaborate on uh, perhaps what, um, what kind of financing might be needed? The, the reason I'm asking is uh, we recently conducted, well, we, every year we conduct an annual survey of our membership to see um, you know, where, the, where the sector is going, what the impacts have been, what challenges still remain. Um, we've, had, we've done this for five years now, and again, for the fifth uh, survey, obviously financing came out to be the top concern for all of our members. Um, and in terms of uh, the type of financing that was needed, debt financing actually continues to rise in, um, in member interest, um, and lack of local currency actually also came up as one of the top Financial financial concerns uh, that members had. So, what you what you described sort of tracks with that. But I wanted to give you an opportunity also to maybe talk a little bit more about um, maybe how we can solve uh, some of these issues and what specifically can be done for the Sierra Leone context. I'm sure if I can jump in on this, um, I think I mean Sierra Leone is very much in line with. Um, you know, the results of your survey in the sense that um, access to affordable working capital, local currency financing um, is still extremely difficult. Um, but I think it's made even more difficult um, in Sierra Leone given the size of the economy, uh, the volatility of, of the local currency as well, um, which means that there's absolutely no sort of foreign um, exchange risk coverage um, uh, products on the market. So any you know thing that you're going to find is going to have to go through something like OPIC or um, MFX or those sort of institutions that provide the, the coverage necessary. Um, I would say a second aspect of things is probably more around seed funding. Um, there's been you know a lot of interest um, in, in East African countries and I think investors uh, investing in East African countries have learned to look at a number of KPIs mm -hmm. um, and some of them um, or penetration of mobile money, for instance, right? And so in everyone's mind, like if you don't have, you know, X percent of penetration of mobile money in a country, it's not even worth it. Um, to a similar extent, the fact that Sierra Leone is a fairly small country, um, even though the number of, of people who are actually lacking electricity access, there's quite a, quite a large number of people, uh, but still, but I think those two aspects, like the size of the, size of the country, awareness of solar, and sort of like the three KPIs um, that are making it a little more difficult um, for a company like ours, which is based in the U.S., to raise um, equity, uh, but I think it's even more, much more difficult for local companies um, who have less ties, I would say, with international uh, finance um, to, to raise money, and there's a real uh, need on that aspect, and I think uh, Renewable Energy um, Association and Powerful to some extent are working you know, very hard to ensure that local companies can also have access to this sort of financing. Thank you, Alex. Amy, did you want to chip in here as well? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with 
um, what Alex said. And as we're developing the energy revolution program design, and we'd made some specific recommendations on, um, you know, um, both distributor finance. Um, we're, you know, we're hoping that concessional um, grants and working capital and equity funds um, can come in, right, um, to help support um, loans to. Um, to the commercial banks and medium term debt financing for payroll companies as well and working capital to cover high initial capital outlay. So there's specific things and for me I think most importantly if we can get some kind of concessional grants um, especially for the local companies that don't have access to international capital um, right. that would that would help. That makes sense. Thank you both. Um, so I have two more quick questions, one for Amy, one for Alex. Um, Amy, I was also, again, very encouraged uh, to hear you mention that um, there is at least work being done on uh, waiving import duties uh, for mm -hmm. distributed energy solutions, if I understood that right, but more encouragingly mm -hmm. than that they need to be IEC certified. This was going mm -hmm. to be one of my questions uh, to you that about kind of quality assessment. Are there national standards in place? Is there a standards body? Would you mind talking a little bit more about the work that's being done um, sort of on getting sort of this done and also ensuring quality products obviously yeah. are distributed in the country? Yeah, so there's a, a standards bureau under the Ministry of Trade, and again, I mentioned earlier, lack of lack of capacity is one of the key things that's that's plaguing government. So there is that there. But what's happened is that um, um, we're using the IEC standard. So what the companies are doing um, is that they're getting a list of products that all the the li a list of these certified products will now be entered into um, the. the the import system or the ASICUDA system, as you will, and that will serve as a basis for the customs to cross-check against um, the products that are coming in. It's 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 a it's a it's a harder way of doing it, but until um, the Renewable Energy Association can properly be um, that betting entity, because I think that's mm -hmm. their main goal, they want to be that arm that bets on behalf of government to say, look, we take a stand for quality, and, and that's actually one of the commitments that they made on the call to action, is that all of our members will go through a rigorous um, um, assessment before they can take advantage of, um, of the, of the um, waivers or the exemptions. So, you know, there is a lot of work that's being done, but we don't have, like, a, um, the Standards Bureau is not, you know, up to the task because they don't have the capacity to be able to affirm themselves or assert themselves to be that entity. So the Renewable Energy Association alongside um, the Serial Imports Authority or the Customs will have to um, work together. Right. Um, and also, as a media somewhat of a follow-up to this. Um, since you did mention mini-grids uh, briefly, I also wanted to touch on that, um, not so that uh, we're looking at both the small-scale distributed but also larger-scale mini-grids. Um, could mm -hmm. you talk a little bit more about sort of what uh, opportunities you see in the sector for mini-grid developers? Um, I guess I'm kind of interested, since you did mention the government was placing, uh, um, you know, a, a lot of interest on large-scale PV mini-grids, Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a, as a government-led sort of initiative um, for, in order to be able to work as a mini-grid developer in Sierra Leone, does it look now like you have, like you have to follow government programs or are there incentives for um, individual developers to come in? Is it, is it, a, is it a good policy well, environment? Is it not a good policy environment? Well, it's been implemented by UNOPS. Um, it's a DFID, um funded projects in partnership with the government. So I think what UNOPS um, has done is they've put out several tenders. So um, mm -hmm. developers are coming in and they basically want the private sector to own um, and add on to these, right? And Alex, I, I know you, you went to a workshop that UNOPS had on this. Um, you can feel free to add. Um, I, I don't know all of the nitty gritties, but I do know that it's, it's a private sector led initiative. It's just that UNOPS is coordinate and, okay. and they put out tenders on the project. Great, thank you. Alex, did you want to uh, follow up on that? Um, no, I mean, I think what and, and everything Amy said is, is um, very much the, the case. Um, mm -hmm. I would be, I would sort of temper 
uh, a little bit her enthusiasm on, on the fact that it's, um, um, I think, private sector led. I think it's it's really in the middle between uh, what, what the UN would do and what the private sector would do. Uh, but the reason is, uh, actually, interestingly enough, I think that the framework, the policy framework for private sector operators building mini grids, um, sort of on their own, is not completely in place yet. Um, and I think one of the reasons, uh, you know, we sort of need this sort of projects is that you're not know, just sort of kind of bear the cost of as they develop and as they help the private sector develop this project, um, also work with the government on making sure they put in place a kind of regulation um, that will allow Sierra Leone to then attract um, fully, you know, market-led um, mini grids um, offers and right. solutions. Great, thank you. Um, and then I guess I will close uh, with a question to Alex. Um, since you have um, had some experience in Sierra Leone so far, I wanted to give you a bit more time, I guess, to talk about maybe not um, not just your challenges, but also sort of what kind of advice you might give to distributed energy uh, service providers and practitioners who might be interested in the Sierra Leonean market now that uh, now that the Ebola outbreak is under control and now that there are these encouraging signs from the government. Um, what has been your biggest challenges? What has been the, the better aspects of working in Sierra Leone? What, what would you suggest to people who might be interested in this sector? Um, sure, yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk a little more um, about this. Um, I think that the number one thing would be don't make, I mean, if you don't know the country, don't make any assumption on, on the country. Um, it's a very, very different business environment um, from, you know, whatever you can see, uh, especially in East Africa, but to some regards, you know, it's going to be a very different different market environment than what you would see in, I don't know, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Ghana, um, in those sort of places. Um, we've actually spent a lot of time and a significant amount of money before moving in uh, doing a very large scale uh, customer survey to have a better understanding um, of our uh, potential customers. Um, and most importantly, we're sort of blessed with, you know, one of our co-founders having lived and, and worked for uh, more than five years now um, in Sierra Leone and having a good understanding of how the society actually works. Um, um, and he was mentioning earlier the fact that they they were involving the chiefs um, during one of their uh, sort of awareness campaigns, uh, and this is one aspect, uh, I guess, of uh, the Sierra Leonean society that's very important to understand and understand how it works um, if you want to establish a successful distribution network. Um, and this chief structure in Sierra Leone is very different from the chief structure in Senegal, um, mm -hmm. and it's very different from the sort of power structure that you can find in East Africa, where you know you don't necessarily have this sort of structure um, that is still in place. Um, so I think that would be my, my number one um, sort of sort of advice, um, which which has yeah saved us a lot of a lot of a lot of, a lot of trouble. Um, and so the consequence of that advice is really go out um, and pilot and survey um, you know as early as possible. Um, and I think this is true not only of Sierra Leone but of all those markets that are a little less um, explored. Um, and that's that's been yeah, really really helpful for us. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you both of you again uh, for joining us for this webinar. I guess uh, Stephanie, I'll turn it over to you now to see if uh, there might be any follow-up questions from our attendees as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and your questions are actually very much in line with a lot of the questions we've received, so thank you for asking them. I think we've uh, answered a lot of things that have come in. Um, a few things uh, that people are asking for more information on. Um, Ami, you had mentioned a list of um, IEC whose products that the government of Sierra Leone is putting together. Um, some people are asking how can they get that list and also what are the steps to get a product onto that list? Um, and, okay, I, I, I think I said the Renewable Energy Association. So it's not the government, it's the private sector companies okay. that are putting that list together. So it's coming from them and then they're giving it to government. Say this is our list and I, I don't think that list is static. Um, I think um, it continues to be added on. And for anyone coming in, like Alex said, it's, it's, it'd be a good thing to get in touch with the Renewable Energy Association. Okay. Wonderful. And in the um, area of uh, sort of more rural communities, can you tell us more about uh, energy access for productive users in those areas and what are the existing solutions and what opportunities are there to provide um, energies to these more rural areas of Sierra Leone? 
Oh, wow, like I mentioned, I, I, this is fresh <laughs> because I was just in a community where um, they had, it's the bigger, one of the biggest mining towns, uh, they mine Rutile, and they don't have access to the grid, so they resort to um, big generators. Some, uh, somebody comes in, they get a generator and connect various homes, and they're having to pay a whole lot um, just to get um, electricity access. So um, the, the opportunities abound, and I was actually going to and model out um, various um, financial models. You know, so. I think in the earlier um, presentation, um, we have about over 90% of our population, that's both rural and urban, that has that does not have access to grid electricity. So um, and in the rural communities, that's 99% that doesn't have access. So they're either resulting to high expensive de generators, either using um, the t Chinese torches that are also very expensive because they're having to change batteries all the time. And some are still using kerosene. So um, with that said, the opportunities are huge. Wonderful. And Alex, did you have anything um, in your experience to add to that? Um, sure. I mean, I think what's interesting is really, I think there's, when you talk about productive users, um, there's sort of two types of, you know, scales that you can look at, it, um, at like, there's productive use. Uh, on the mining company scale um, and productive use on the, you know, guy who has a freezer and sells, um, you know, cold drinks um, scale. And I think on both those scales, actually, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, and as Amy was saying, we see a lot of people relying on sort of local uh, generator, um, you know, based mini grids. Um, so there's a lot of market and we're actually ourselves distributing um, a number of productive uses, um, sort of appliances. Um, that our customers can use with, with solar already. Wonderful. Um, another question com has come in on um, if there are any learnings from East Africa that may be um, applicable or useful in a West African context that uh, either of you have drawn from? I um, yeah, maybe to jump in on this one. Or, I mean, do you want to go ahead? Um, I mean, we're we're losing your um, because audio for the campaign. Again. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Maybe not. Um, um, Ami, Alex, do you want to uh, jump in first and we'll try to uh, connect, uh, get Ami's connection sure. back on track. Thank you. Sure. I mean, I think that the first um, sort of set of learnings, I would say, that we're drawing from East Africa um, has been more on the, you know, how to develop the sector uh, fronts. And as an association, as the Renewable Energy Association of Sierra Leone, um, we that model. Look, we've, we've looked a lot into um, what's been done in terms of renewable energy associations um, in the Eastern African markets, uh, what's been, how they've been working with the government, what kind of policies they've been um, trying to implement, and this has been um, very useful. Um, as a company, I think that, you know, almost most of the learnings uh, from the industry um, in East Africa are true in Sierra Leone. There's just like a few you know, key aspects like anything related to move money, you know, that's what I mentioned before, uh, that are not the case here in Sierra Leone. But I mean, take for instance, you know, the importance of credit assessment uh, in order to make sure that as a distributed energy company that does pay go, uh, you're not going to run into too many um, defaults um, and how to do those credit assessments. I think a lot of the work that's currently being um, undertaken in East Africa is very, very, very um, relevant to what we're doing here in, here in Sierra Leone. Thank you. And um, Ami, I'm so sorry that we're having some connection issues still, but thank you so much for, for sticking with us. Um, are you able to hear me now? We, we weren't able to get your answer to that. All right, no worries. We'll, oh, 
Okay, no, it's fine. I'm just gonna. E I was just gonna echo what Alex said. So, yeah, everything that's happening in Af in East Africa, we've been able to um, kind of see how we can adapt um, to the local market, and we're learning a lot from what's happening there. And especially, I think I mentioned the school campaigns earlier that Ibis Oxfam is doing. That's a that's a direct replication from a campaign that happened in East Africa, and we're hoping that. It can now be, you know, um, instead of just the six districts, it can be replicated across the board. Thank you. Um, and we had a, a specific question come in, and this might um, be a bit too specific, but I wanted to give it a shot anyway. Um, do you, uh, so I mean, are you aware of any work being done in bioenergy interventions in the region, including clean cook stoves uh, that you could highlight? Um, there are, unfortunately, I've not um, engaged with them. Um, I myself own a, a waste management company, and we're doing. Uh, we will ultimately be doing waste, uh, so biomass, waste to energy. Um, so I can talk a little bit more about that personally. But in terms of the cook stove, I don't. I don't have unless Alex um, is aware of any projects specifically by name. Um, no, I know there's, there's a, actually a manufacturer um, of clean cook stove. There's a, a very crafty and, and smart Sierra Leonean who's developed his own product um, here in Freetown, um, but he hasn't really reached you know, a countrywide um, scale. Um, and just like Amy was saying, I'm not aware of, of any sort of large scale initiative on the clean. Okay, wonderful. Um, and Actually, we did just receive, um, I mean, if you'd like to elaborate on the um, <laughs> energy, we actually just the received the energy. question want to hear more. <laughs> Excellent. Well, yes, I have a waste management company, Masada, and basically we're, it's two components. We're doing the waste collection now, but ultimately we, we will be converting um, up to about six megawatts of which um, it'll, the technology is anaerobic digestion, of which we will have two, two megawatts installations that we will fit to the grid. So we're talking with government on um, um, firming up our PPA. And then we will then have 50 to 100 kilowatt um, mini digesters that we can directly um, supply to manufacturing companies, hotels, or any other industries that need that, that power capacity. Um, very soon, in a, a, you know, next quarter, we will be piloting the first 50 kilowatt hour digester. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, that is all we have for questions. Oh, uh, that is all we have for questions right now. So I'd love to um, give you all a chance for any closing remarks, something you, you wish to highlight more before we sign off here. Um, Alex, we'll start with you and then go to Amy and then yes, if there's anything else you'd like, uh, like to put out there. Thanks. Um, I mean, thanks for the opportunity for to take part in this in this webinar. Um, I think my closing remark would be that um, when we built this company, um, we were studying actually the three co-founders um, in the U.S. Uh, energy access, and it seemed, you know, reading all the reports and the literature um, on what was happening in the Pago Solar. Uh, from that, you know, most of what had to be discovered and, and developed, you know, was sort of discovered and developed um, in this market. Um, and I just want to say that it's, it's, it's extremely exciting to actually work in West Africa, uh, where there's actually a lot more um, to develop, to invent, to create in terms of business and, and distribution model. Um, and I would really encourage more uh, companies and investors uh, alike to, to really get involved into, uh, into the space. Thanks again. Thank you. Um, Ami, anything else you would uh, like to add? Yeah, I just want to echo um, Alex's sentiments. Um, Sierra Leone is open for business, especially in the energy access um, area. Um, the energy revolution is happening here. A lot of things are happening. Government is commit committed. And, um, you know, there's a strong sector stakeholder engagement that's happening to help smooth things out. So at least, you know, when an investor comes in, they have places to go that they're able to um, quickly get things done. All right, so it sounds like we've... Um, we've so I welcome...
um, investors that are looking um, at, you know, All right. Well, it's, um, thank you so much, Ami. It looks like we've uh, lost your audio a little bit again. Um, Yasmin, did you have anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up here? Uh, sure. No, thank you again uh, to everyone, um, and especially to Ami and Alex for joining us today. Um, and just to say that uh, this was this was a great learning experience for myself as well. Hopefully it was useful for a lot of people, and we will continue um, to uh, host more country-specific webinars with uh, the Clean Energy Solutions Center. So if you have any suggestions or requests for countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that we should look at, feel free to send them through to Stephanie. Um, otherwise, we will see you at our next webinar. Wonderful. Thank you all so much uh, for your participation in today's webinar, both uh, to the, all of our panelists and the attendees. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, learn a little bit more with us. Uh, we invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about the Solutions Center resources and services, including the no-cost policy, policy support through Ask an Expert. Uh, we also invite you to visit our website, cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training to view the slides from today and listen to a recording of any either today's presentation or any previously held webinars. Uh, today's recording will be posted within a week. Finally, I ask you to kindly take a moment to complete a short survey that will appear as we conclude the webinar. And with that, please enjoy the rest of your day. We hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. And this concludes our webinar. <laughs>